We have a, a powerhouse panel this morning. Um, today we'll be talking about high-risk populations, identifying and addressing the needs of the most vulnerable. And this morning um, I'm joined by Richard Brookshire, who's the co-founder and uh, board chair of the Black Veterans Project, by Wendy McClinton, who is the president and CEO of Black Veterans for Social Justice, and Ashton Stewart, who is the manager of the Sage Vets uh, program at SAGE. So we're going to kick this off. Um, I'm going to pass the mic to each of our panelists to give uh, some brief opening remarks to really communicate those high points of what they want you to know. So Richard, I'll kick it over to you first. Hi, um, thanks for having me. Thanks to Andrea and thanks Derek for being so transparent in your remarks. Um, I am a veteran of the Army. I served for seven years as a combat medic um, and got out in 2016. I subsequently gradu uh, finished graduate school around the same time. Um, and on paper, I think to most, I made a seamless transition out. Um, but I always make the reference point that I joined uh, the military on the heels of Obama's victory in 28, uh, 2008 and then got out at the heels of Donald Trump uh, You know, about eight years later. And uh, it was a bit of a whiplash for me to acclimate back um, to a country that I didn't necessarily recognize and kind of coming to full consciousness as an adult, having just went through um, a very transformative experience, not only just as a Black vet, but as a queer vet, you know, having served half of my career under Don't Ask, Don't Tell as well. And the traumas of those things, I think I wasn't quite aware of until uh, I officially kind of got out and found myself um, struggling to find who it is I was um, and um, struggling to find um, my inner spirit again, if that makes um, any sense to some folks. Um, and so that work has led me to the work that I do now with Black Veterans Project, uh, looking at systemic disparities and everything from disability allocation to um, the ways in which uh, Black vets are funneled into the military and to service-oriented roles, um, hindrance to retirement because of bad paper discharges, um, and then how, how that affects disparate outcomes when it comes to Black veteran homelessness and unemployment and so on and so forth. And so um, our work, um, our primary partnerships are with Yale Law School and Columbia University, and it's been great to see how it's been, grown, um, but it was certainly birthed out of my own uh, suicide attempt and my own struggles. Thank you, Richard. Um, and I also should share a little bit about myself before we pass, pass it on. I'm a Navy veteran, um, and I also uh, currently work at the Department of Defense on issues related to sexual assault, harassment, and suicide prevention, although I'm here in a personal capacity. Um, but I think it's important to note before we continue that everyone here represents populations that have been explicitly discriminated about, against um, for who they are, whether it's because the military actively segregated for uh, more than a century up until the middle of the 20th century and uh, that there were caps on women in the, in the armed forces and there were bans <laughs> on what jobs women could do until five years ago. And, um, the, and don't ask, don't tell and the trans ban and preceding policies. So we're talking about the legacy of those policies as well. Um, and so Ashton, I'll kick it over to you next. Thank you very much, Andrea. Um, I'm Ashton Stewart, I use he, him, his pronouns, combat veteran of the US Navy. Honored to be part of this esteemed panel and this program. Um, thank you to Governor Hochul and the New York State Health Foundation for putting it together. It's a very heavy topic to discuss, um, but it's essential to have these conversations. Um, Derek, thank you as well. Uh, man, what an intro. Um, you've always, you're always so willing to share. Um, Richard, you as well. Um, some of these things are just, you know, it's trauma. Um, but trauma is the one thing I think that unites us all. I think human beings have all experienced it at some level. Um, so uh, these are the conversations that unite us. And this is how we overcome trauma and start on the road to recovery. Um, I'm the program manager for Sage Vets. It's a New York State program for older LGBTQ plus veterans. Started in 2014, I've been with the program at SAGE since 2018, and it's just been a complete and utter honor to be part of this program. Um, prior to working with SAGE, I was in voting advocacy, but during my, uh, uh, getting my master's degree, one of my professors served in the same conflict as I did, um, and he was just 
incredibly engaging. And that's when I made the decision that I really want to work with veterans. So this has just been a thrilling opportunity for me. Um, we all know that statistic far too well that there's 21 veterans every single day that commit suicide. Um, and so that was uh, between that and the discrimination that LGBTQ plus veterans have faced over the years, um, Sage really wanted to make a direct impact and see what we could do to help. Um, they've, they've done studies and, and discovered that, you know, a lot of the, the veterans that have committed suicide are also 65% were over the age of 50. Sage Vets is uh, designed for LGBTQ plus veterans over the age of 50, like I said, for the whole state of New York. Um, so we, we promote the, we share their stories uh, to try to get people up to speed on some of the, the situations that they've overcome and some of the challenges that they face during their service. Um, and how it's affected their lives. And uh, discharge upgrades, like uh, Richard was talking about, is one of the, the main things that we focus on as well. Um, there were over 114,000 veterans discharged for being LGBTQ plus between World War II and the end of Donetsk Hotel, which was 2011. Um, I've got some other stuff here to share in a little bit, but I'm gonna take a pause here. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Ashton. Now, Wendy, over to you. Hello, everyone, and greetings from Black Veterans for Social Justice to this August body of the presenters and the conference that's been going on so, so far. It truly has been enlightening. It's been enriching. It's been encouraging, even motivating at times to know that there is help and that there's another voice that we can share and hear and dialogue with until we are able to stand firm and make sure that the traumas that we've gone through to make sure that someone else, that we can help them along the way or even prevent these traumas from happening. I'm a 10 year United States Army Desert Storm Persian Gulf Arab vet. I'm 70% service connected, PTSD and military sexual trauma. I got out the military, left the military honorably discharged in 1994 and came back home and was homeless with three children under the age of five. And um, it was this organization that I work for currently that was able to provide me the resources because there was nowhere for a female veteran with women with three children under the age of five at that time to go. There were no shelters. There was one shelter, I think it was called Borden Avenue and it's still here today. And these are some of the things that we work on when we have individuals, veterans that are homeless, especially women veterans, where are they to go? And it was Black Veterans for Social Justice that not only helped me make that transition from military to civilian life, but they also gave me my first job and they also gave me my first apartment. And I was able to move out of the EAU in the Bronx after being there for about six to nine months with my children trying to make that adjustment back so and it's with that same fervor that they gave me in 1994 we still try to deliver those qualitative services to all homeless veterans honorably discharged not honorably discharged and we try to serve everyone that walks through that door with tender loving care and a listening ear so i look forward to sharing and i look forward to hearing and learning with this august body today thank you wendy so um a very important thing that's already come up in our opening is, is the issue of discharges and character of discharges and discharge upgrades. So my first question for the panel is, so each of you represents communities of veterans who have always served our country and have not only not necessarily received the rec recognition that you deserve, but have also experienced explicit discrimination. What impact has racism, misogyny, homophobia, transphobia, and other forms of discrimination had on the communities you represent regarding mental health and the risk of suicide. And please feel free to elaborate on why this issue of discharge is so important. And since we, I'm gonna go in the backwards order that we did for introduction. So Wendy, um, I'll start with you. One of the struggles that I had, especially when I was um, dealing with military sexual trauma in the military and dealing with that, you know, in those times, there was really no one to tell. There was no one to talk to. And it wasn't, it, there was no chain of command because the trauma was in the chain of command. It started in basic training through AIT and then moved to Korea. So 
in that military sexual trauma, one thing that I learned was that, you know, you don't retreat, that you just had to be the best soul that you could be. And being that there was no one to tell at that time, there was no one to share, you didn't know which way to go. I waited until after I got out of the military to begin, we would have a safe place to talk about the trauma that took place with me. And having that discrimination and coming home and having to share that and then made, being made to feel that I was the victim, that I now had to prove that I was victimized. And it wasn't enough that my word said that this is what took place. And then, um, then saying and having to hear, well, you know what, being a woman veteran, stuff like that, you know, you shouldn't have been there in the first place. You know, um, women were never meant to serve you know, those type of harsh realities and those type of harsh words. And then even having to go to the VA and then at that time, because the VA has improved vastly. But during that time, it was a place where it was dominantly men. It really wasn't geared for women. And having to be that, I guess I want to say one of the first women that they really had to strengthen their services with. Strengthen, you know, the different... Um, systems and coaching and, and, and um, therapy, those things that they had to do. So it was really being made to be able to be, receive a safe space. And now they've done that. There's safe spaces for women to talk. It had to evolve over a period of time. And it took a lot of conversations. It took a lot of door closing. It took a lot of slams in your face. But yet, we still had a place at a certain time where we could talk and we can share. And we're still developing that especially even more traumatic when you have children. Because coming out the military with a family, the military now active duty, they take care of the total family. So when you come out the military and you just have you, they only take care of the veteran. So now where are those services for that woman veteran with children? Yes, you take care of me at the VA, but what happens to my children? And now I'm subject to the um, assistitudes of the civilian population, having to maneuver and have the um, HRA, um, having to maneuver public assistance, having to maneuver to get those services for my children, but yet having not getting the services for me, but not from that family. And that put more trauma. It delayed the time that I could get help for the issues that I needed to get help so that I could get a job, that I could feel safe, that I could feel safe. Thank you, Wendy. And you bring up a really important point about this continuum of traumatic invalidation and these bureaucratic systems perpetuating harm. And it's not just this the incident of experiencing military sexual trauma, but the way these bureaucracies respond to individuals who are survivors. And that it's so critical in the work that we do to think about how our systems may be uh, maybe perpetuating those systems of injustice. Um, and I also want to share as, as a woman veteran, we have a, I have a great deal of gratitude for Gulf Warrior veterans because you were the ones who really kicked down the door at VA to demand the health care that we deserve. And it was a real kick <laughs> and they kicked back. <laughs> but it, it was really hard, you know, having to have served and served honorably even though you had military sexual trauma, in some ways it can go, the spectrum can go either way. You can decompensate or you can turn around and say, okay, I'll deal with this when I get out. Because if I deal with it while I'm in, I'm not, I'm gonna have a greater fight and I might not be discharged honorably. So let's be discharged honorably and deal with the fight. The problem the fight is today, it's still happening. You know, when you look at those um, individuals like Vanessa Gilliam over in Texas, you know, all these different tragedies of individuals who have tried to go through the bureaucracy of the, um, the armed forces. I'm a strong believer that anything that deals with your human rights should not be handled by the, um, the judiciary system of the United States Armed Forces. It should be taken out of their hands and dealt with in the United States courts, not in the military. Thank you, Wendy. And the issue of military justice is certainly an outstanding question. The Secretary of Defense um, has already announced that uh, cases related to, to sexual assault will be taken outside of the chain of command. 
Um, and now there's pending legislation at the, and at this point, it's which offenses. Um, it's not if, it's, it's, it's what. Um, Ashton, um, I'll go over to you next for, for uh, the same question, which is what has been the impact of um, different forms of discrimination on, on um, your community regarding mental health and the risk of suicide? Thank you, Andrea. Yes, um, even with an honorable discharge, it's difficult, as Wendy just described, to, to find and secure services that are necessary to, to help you survive and to live well and healthy. Um, I can't imagine as, as a mother with children in that situation, it's just awful to have served your country and get an honorable discharge and to be struggling like that is really inexcusable. Inex it's shameful. Um, and let alone the people who don't have an honorable discharge, those people who are discharged with no TH or misconduct discharge or bad paper of any sort, they are told they are not veterans. They served, they could have been in combat and they are told they are not veterans. Um, I have a case of somebody who was in a situation like that and was told he wasn't a veteran and has been struggling for over 35 years. And we were able to have a conversation with him because he just decided one day to open up um, to another social worker and then that led him to SAGE. And the conversation that we had, it's just so deep and profoundly traumatic. Um, and we helped him understand and see that he is a veteran according to uh, chapter 101 of title 38. And he got a housing voucher as a veteran um, but, but placed on the top of the list for looking for housing. It's still a struggle because he's caring for his mother um, and uh, she's disabled and in a wheelchair and a lot of these vouchers can't find a, an accessible apartment. So there's other problems associated with it too. It's such a flawed system. Um, and there's just so many veterans out there that have been discharged this way, especially LGBT veterans who served prior to or during Don't Ask, Don't Tell, who have not come forward, who aren't part of the Sage Vest program, who aren't reaching out to get help, and even if they need it. And especially during the COVID era here uh, for the last year and a half plus, um, it's been really hard. And so what we do is we share these stories in our newsletters, we share them when we talk to providers, we share them when we talk to legislators at the city and state level, um, even the federal level sometimes, um, just to let them know, hey, this is what's happened to some of these individuals. Here's what you can do to help them um, who have served your country to protect your democracy. Um, another flaw in the system is in 1980, they made it a requirement to serve two full years of active duty in order to get VA healthcare. We discovered this through a case from somebody who was a victim of a gay purge in the Air Force, was kicked out um, within 15 months of his service, ruined his career. He had his eyes set on doing security after completing his four years. Um, and he's been struggling ever since. He, and he was kicked out for being gay um, and set up by the military because they used to conduct these gay purges all the time. It's, it's known fact in the 1980s, it was notorious, all branches of service. Um, and so many providers and legislators are like, wow, we thought if, if people got a discharge upgrade, that would take care of it. But no, it doesn't. It doesn't fill in that gap for that veteran in particular, doesn't fill in those missing months. So he's still ineligible for VA healthcare. Um, there's just so many things out there that we discover through this work. Um, New York State is a leader. Uh, they had a bill last year um, that was signed by the governor um, called the Restoration of Honor Act. It covers veterans with a no teach discharge for PTSD, MST, TBI, and uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. You can appeal to the State Division of Veteran Services, plead your case, and uh, they'll look into the documentation, look at your service records, and they will give you an upgrade. And we've seen it happen with multiple veterans already through our program to help from the State Division. Um, and there's other states that are doing uh, similar legislation. We're actually bringing in five states who have active legislation, Restoration of Honor Act legislation on November 18th to discuss how it came about, um, to discuss where there are still gaps, and also encourage other states to get on board. Um, waiting for the federal government, you know, we could do that all for generations. Um, so states are taking an active leadership role here, and it's really exciting. Um, and when they reached out to Sage Vets when they were putting together the Restoration of Honor Act, I, as a veteran, and all of us here who are veterans have seen military justice, um, but the word justice doesn't really fit because it's, it's not 
fair. And that's why civilian courts are being looked at now for some of these cases and issues. Um, when they asked us, I'm like, you should consider allowing anybody with an OTH discharge or misconduct or any sort of discharge, give them a second chance to plead their case. Because a lot of the veterans we work with, they were dis discharged for being LGBTQ plus, um, but the incident that led to the discharge was going AWOL because they were being harassed or discriminated against, or they got into an altercation with an officer. Um, there's just a many substance abuse. There's just so many different reasons that they were discharged, but it all points back to discrimination. Um, so unfortunately they didn't uh, uh, take our <laughs> suggestion, but you know that just shows that there's work to be done. Thank you. Thank you, Ashton. And now over to you, Richard. Yeah, thank you, Wendy and Ashton. You guys gave really thorough responses. I don't have too much to add, um, but I'll say, you know, I just recently went through my own disability uh, claims process um, almost five years after you know, officially getting out. And it was traumatic um, in many respects. Um, and I think one of the things that I had to recognize when I was filing that disability claim was that I had survived military sexual trauma and um, not and wanting to be able to admit that out loud. And I think something that was alarming, but also brought me some relative level of comfort, but still very alarming, um, was that 43% uh, of the individuals that experience military sexual trauma in the military um, uh, identify as LGBTQ. Um, and then half of those that uh, experience uh, military sexual trauma are, are actually men, and so many don't come forward. Um, and so I think that was an important point to note. I think something else that I always like to mention about this um, is just how the role, the role that race plays. There's a, a case that we, have, Black Veterans Project had uh, co-authored an amicus brief on uh, about a year and a half ago now, uh, Gary Jackson be the Secretary of the Navy. It was a petition for review by the Supreme Court, but they denied. He essentially was arguing that Title VII of the Civil Rights Act should apply and provide protections, the same protections that civilians um, get from their employers. The Civil Rights Act actually doesn't apply to the military. Um, long story short, he had served 19 years um, in, and was a Gulf War era veteran, served most into the 80s, into the early 90s, and um, experienced ardent discrimination. And the courts agreed that he experienced and had evidence of, of facing ardent discrimination, but he was still, he got an honorable discharge, but he doesn't have his retirement and he's in his 60s. Um, working as a security guard just to feed himself, right? And so yeah, I'm sure his case is not necessarily unique, but the role that racism and homophobia and, 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 uh, and, and all types of isms play in creating hostile work environments without actually pro providing any, any reliable measure of, of redress um, um, or protections or um, the ability to be able to go and um, to be able to get the, the benefits that you've earned. And, 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 and sometimes we look specifically at disability. Um, that's the, 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 the main project that Black Veterans is, is a project is looking at is studying disparities in disability allocation, um, but retirement is also one um, that so many have been stripped of. So, yeah. Thank you, Richard. And so you've all also touched on a really important point, which is that veterans don't live in a closed society. Um, for example, this issue of housing vouchers. If the housing market is incredibly expensive, that might impact your ability to still find housing, even if you get a voucher. So what other forms of, of transformative or restorative justice and work towards equity would best support your communities? And Richard, I'll start with you. Um, I think this is a complicated conversation and I'll just kind of talk about what we've been doing at, at Black Veterans Project. We've been looking specifically at disparities in disability allocation and working alongside Yale to, to look at pathways for, um, pathways for restitution or reparations. Um, on behalf of Black vets, and that work is is, is starting to gain a lot of momentum. Um, we recently found out that the VA has data that it's buried around disability um, uh, disability disparities, and wanting to get our hands on that data to use that as a tool um, um, in in our work. Um, and then, second to that, um, the the sorry, the question was about um, about what 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 work that we're doing broadly. Sorry lost train my thought. It's also election day and I run comms at the human rights campaign. So my, 
my head is like 20 million places and I'm getting a ton of emails. So I apologize. <laughs> so not just your work, but what, what else would support your community? So, um, so for example, Wendy brought up the issue of childcare, which is a huge mm -hmm. issue um, it, for parents and disproportionately impacts women. And, and that has been a huge issue for women veterans and the ability to access care. So, um, yeah. Well, I think of, of one forthcoming bill um, that uh, Congressman Moulton and Congressman Clyburn are ready to introduce, I think in the next couple of days, called the GI Bill Repair Act. And so we know that during World War II when the GI Bill was at its advent, um, many black vets were locked out of that. Um, and it, that has generational consequence. And so we don't, when we talk about veterans, and I think Wendy made that point about not forgetting that they have families that they often support. Um, and when they're stripped of their benefits, that can be felt generations later, um, whether it be through the inability to pass down um, housing that you've purchased um, in the generational wealth that's afforded through that, um, or the ability to share your education, um, education benefits should you decide not to use it yourself. Um, so that bill is gonna be consequential as it seeks to, to extend um, GI Bill benefits to the direct descendants of World War II veterans, but it also uh, it, it intends to begin a blue ribbon panel um, to study the ways in which um, uh, minority vets writ large have been locked out of their, their benefits. So I'm, I'm kind of a, I wear a policy hat when I look at a lot of these things. So um, I think legislation and pathways to litigation for me are um, a primary mechanism for our community to be able to get the resources that are already available, but they're largely locked out of. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Wendy, do you have a follow-up to that? Oh, yeah. They, um, a lot of things right now, what we're doing at Black Vets, we're finding that a lot of veterans, especially women veterans and, and family, or even it's not just women, um, women with children, but it's also male veterans who are the lead and have children as well. So we can sort of veteran with family. And what we do is until they, we can get them to the services or to help them with the services for the family, what we try to do is develop linkages with other community-based organizations, especially our houses of worship, um, other community-based organizations that deal with childcare that can fill the need or provide some in-kind service to assist the family until you know some sort of benefit or a job or how is concerned. So um, they may need childcare. They may need pots or pans, some things for the home. They may need just a night out to woosaw for a second. They may need, yeah, they may need to um, be able to learn how to transition from being a soldier to a mother or transition from being a soldier to a lady or a woman or whichever way you want to, because you so all the time and we, and I had, no, I had that, that problem, trying to find my feminine, feminine self when I came home, because I've always the boots, the soldier, the ruck pack, the march, you know, all of these different things. So we try to deal and think with that. And one of the other things that we're working on is how to make New York City veteran friendly, because it's not, you know, it's so it's sad that we live, we work in Brooklyn and all the, the VA has to be ecumenical across the board. So the VA, the five VAs that are here in the five boroughs are not the same and doesn't have the same qualitative services as Northport on Long Island or somewhere in Lyons in New Jersey. Those are the different things that we have to try to eliminate. Those are the things that cause these disparities. You know, because everybody's not getting the service. I heard Richard talk about housing and Ashton talk about housing, developing housing, affordable housing for veterans. We have communities where they're building up day by day by day. How many people or how many veterans do we bombard our um, elected officials to make sure that they hold these developers accountable? Say, so guess what? You're developing this in our neighborhood. Guess what? A lot of our veterans live here that need housing. How many of these units are you going to um, make affordable just for them? You know, those are the type of things that we need to do and trying to do within our community. So again, like kicking down the walls to the VA, that was one start. We have to kick down the walls to the city of New York or even sometimes the state to hold individuals accountable. It shouldn't be like someone said, how do you serve your country and not have a place to stay in it? I think that should be part of the transition package. You serve, you get a home. I don't have a problem with that. I don't know why they have a problem with that, but it makes a way that someone who served their country, all right, you got something from the country. You say, 
Thank you for your service. Well, some of the services that our veterans receive, it doesn't, are you really thankful? Because some of the services that you give don't equate to the service that they get. Thank you. And you, you bring up this really important point about housing and um, particularly with women veterans are they're frequently an invisible homeless population because they're most likely to be couch surfing, staying with friends. And right. family. So they're sheltered, but they're not necessarily able to afford their own home. And um, previously when I was working on the House Veterans Affairs Committee, this especially came up with women veterans with children who were either afraid of having the family broken up because of what shelter was available um, or afraid of losing their children because of their um, on how their uh, housing instability. Um, or they're going to school, they're right. going to school and stay in school so that they're able to use the benefit to get the housing to try, which is not enough. So they're in these situations that are now putting them in domestic violence situations. That's a, that's sure. a good, yeah. Um, so, and, and unfortunately for the audience on the issue of childcare, so by law, every VA medical center has to have uh, childcare available within the next five years. And then there are also some other opportunities for um, vouchers to go out into the community. That was part of um, a, a section of the Deborah Sampson Act that was in a, a, an omnibus bill that, that was signed into law back in January. Um, and uh, that was initially based off of a pilot program. And one of those pilot sites is in Buffalo, which I had the opportunity to visit. And uh, there was one uh, veteran, um, a man in his thirties picking up a child. So this is, while this issue predominantly um, disproportionately impacts women, this impacts a lot of veterans. And um, the initial study on, on the usage actually found that the, the single pop demographic that was using the program the, the most were grandfathers who were caring for their grandchildren. So um, there, are, there are a lot of populations who are, who are impacted just by this issue of childcare. Uh, so Ashton, um, over to you on, on, on this question of, of what other form, what other issues um, would, would um, best serve um, uh, older LGBTQ veterans. Thank you, Andrew. Um, grassroots, like Wendy was saying, it's boots on the ground, local level. Just get out there and start having these conversations about identifying what policy gaps you see for the population you're serving and talking to people who can make a difference or join your mission to address it and to give voice to it. Um, New York State, did it at the state level with the restoration of honor, as did uh, Rhode Island, Connecticut, um, Colorado, and Illinois. Um, and the other thing I just want to say, in, in April of last year, the New York State Suicide Prevention Task Force identified um, the prevalence of attempted suicide as 4.6 for the general U.S. population, but it's 10 to 20 percent among LGB persons and 39 to 55 percent among trans individuals. Um, and this report also went on to show that suicide rates are shown to be higher among veterans that do not use the VA. Um, and there are some serious trust issues with older LGBT veterans going to the VA because they think of the VA as the military, same culture, same sort of systems. Um, we're only 10 years away from ending Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And that's a big cultural shift. Up until that time, it was permissible and part of policy to discriminate. People hid who they were, they hid their sexual orientation, they hid any sort of uh, health conditions that they had that they, they might have had needed help for, treatment for. Um, just awful, just so inhumane. Um, and the other thing that's really concerning is that New York State ranks fifth in the nation for the size of its veteran population, and yet most of the veterans in the state don't receive their health care at the VA. So that's the other thing that we're, we're really trying hard to change. Um, the VA has made a great effort to uh, promote their programs and services for LGBTQ plus veterans, um, including this year, they announced that they're gonna start offering gender confirming surgery, which is a lifesaver for many people. Um, it's just a game changer. And on the 17th of this month, we're, we're getting representatives from all, all five boroughs, from the, the Har Harbor Healthcare Network, 
to talk about some of the specialized services that are currently available to LGBTQ plus veterans um, that are lesser known about. Um, because there's LGBT veteran care coordinators at every VA. Every VA health medical center is supposed to have one, um, but the saying goes, you've been to one VA, you've been to one VA, um, because they all function a little differently. Um, but it's up to us to make sure they're culturally competent as veterans and as advocates. Um, it's to, to have conversations with whoever is assuming that role um, to make sure that they are actually offering the services that are available and they're actually helping LGBTQ plus veterans navigate properly um, and feel supported. Uh, so that's one of the things that we've been really focused on most recently. Thanks, Ashton. So um, we're now going to roll into uh, discussing some 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 bright spots and uh, best practices, resources that have been really helpful to you personally and to your community. I can certainly say, for one, uh, when I was living in in upstate New York full time, um, the Albany B VA was was initially one of the pilot sites for distributing iPads to do telehealth. And the reason for that was most of the most of the people using that VA lived really far away and the weather sucks. So, you know, I lived an hour away and, and to go to therapy, it would take three hours out of my work day, which I didn't have. And half the winter there's, there's ice and snow on the ground. Um, and then it also just, it made for me, the ability to access care felt so much safer um, just from the ability to um, use telehealth. And that started, that was well before the pandemic. So that's just one example. Um, so, so Richard, um, I'll, I'll go to you is what have been some, some protective factors that you've identified as being really helpful? Yeah. Um, so I just recently located to DC and, um, I had an emotional conversation with my primary care from the Harlem health clinic. Um, because he had been my provider for the better part of nine years. And so the VA can be a big bureaucracy, but I will say that um, being able to seek care in, on an individual level at the, at the VA clinics uh, was transformative um, for me. And they felt like family, you know, over time uh, to me. Um, and also, I, th I do think telehealth um, at the VA has been a, a bit of a lifesaver as well. Um, and, and that is uh, definitely a resource that I've leaned into. And so even though, you know, I can, the things that kind of led up to my suicide attempt was trying to navigate the bureaucracy of the VA, once I actually was able to get the services, they've been tremendously helpful uh, to me. Um, and then second to that, I think, you know, being able to foster community um, amongst like individuals. So whether it be other LGBTQ veterans um, and certainly other black vets have, have, has also been, I think, incredibly helpful to be able to share in intergenerational conversations, let alone a cross-generation conversation um, and, and to formulate community and support systems in that respect. Um, that Those are the things that I think have inspired me to, to foster that um, for the next generation that's coming up and to reach out um, and across um, to invite people into the work that we're doing at, at Black Veterans Project, because I know that a lot of people are looking for a community, but a lot of times can't find it. That's a great point. And, and that reminds me, I mean, I, I, I didn't really find this community where I really felt like I belonged until after I got out. Um, I was a commissioned officer and the officer corps is um, even more white and male. Um, less diverse than the majority of the force. The enlisted force looks like America. The officer corps does not. And um, it wasn't until I, I became a Tillman scholar right after I, I left active duty where all of a sudden there were all of these other veterans who were um, openly LGBTQ and, and, and women who didn't want to participate in um, misogyny and patriarchy and, and veterans who are also religious minorities. And, and so, and finding that community encouraged me to participate more in the veterans community to find people like vets like us. And, um, and I, I feel like sometimes that was life-saving in, in the summer of 2019, I had the worst depressive episode I've had in my life. And it was that community was like, no, seriously, like, get on medication, this is what you can do, talk to these people and really, really got me through it. Um, so that, that, that issue of, of community and the fact that we can find it, I think more easily as veterans than we could have when we were disconnected from one another 
uh, while we were in uniform, I think is incredibly powerful. So um, over to um, uh, Wendy, um, what, uh, what have you identified as being protective and helpful for your community? Having another base, you know, my family was there, but I couldn't go home because my family now became foster parents. So the room that we stayed in, you know, were, was helping some other children that were in need. But then I also found respite in my church, you know, and, and they had a veteran group that was meeting there. That's what drew me to them. And it was safe and the veterans were able to talk about anything. There was no hold or no bar. It was just a space. I don't know if they attended the church. I don't know what they did, but they were there. They were sharing, they were talking. And it was when I got out in 1994, I didn't go. I was so angry with the military. I didn't really go and seek out VA help until maybe eight years later, eight or nine years later. And it was that, that church that was able to provide the support. Also, it was Black Veterans for Social Justice, finding a community-based organization where there was like minds. You know, they had, because the founder was military, the board was ex-military. It was founded by Vietnam era vets, you know, that knew the plight, that, that understood. You know, I was one of the first female veterans that they even hired, you know? So I was new to them, just like they were new to me and we learned and we grew and then finding out what works and what didn't work, asking veterans, what do you need instead of trying to stuff stuff down their throat, ask them what you need for you to be able to eat, to grow, to learn and develop. You know, it, a lot of times people, they don't access anything. They just give us what they think we should have instead of having those discussions and saying, hey, you know, I really don't need you know, an SRO, I really need a one bedroom, you know what I'm saying? So I can have some place for my child. I really don't need, I mean, one of the things, and I'll tell you when you talk about depression, when I came home and they told me I was going to have all these services and none of them were available except for unemployment. And every time I went to the doctor, they would, if I said I had a cold, they'd ask me, when was my last pap smear? Um, I have a fever. When was my, you know, it was those things. But then when you came outside and you got with the other vets, they gave you support and they said, guess what? You know, it's going to get better. It's not going to always be like this. And it was those hope and listening to the stories of other veterans, like, you know, like yourself and everyone else here, I was able to cope until I was able, I know what it is to self-medicate. I know what it is, you know, to be so gone that I don't even know if I'm going to get back, you know, and not having that and having a safe space and my job and my church and other veterans gave me that safe space. We need more safe spaces. Thank you, Wendy. Now, Ashton, over to you. What's been helpful? Well, thank you. Um, yeah, just to piggyback on what Wendy said, I mean, trauma, yeah, it just unites us, you know, <laughs> it really does. And it helps us overcome, um, which is terrific. Um, some of the programs in particular have really been invaluable, especially during COVID. Um, there's a home-based primary care program at the VA um, that we're able to connect veterans to uh, when they can't, they're immobile for whatever reason. Um, that's been super helpful. Vet centers, um, they don't care what kind of discharge you have. If you served a day, great. They will help you out with uh, counseling for MST or any sort of mental health support that you could benefit from. So we've been plugging people into vet centers across the state. Um, telehealth, um, just checking in, that's been really vital too. Um, and there's some other things that we're doing uh, through partnerships. Um, Black Veterans for Social Justice has helped us out many times with veteran cases. The New York State Division of Veterans Services, as Derek mentioned, um, Benjamin Pomerantz will call you, you, you He'll call you, if you reach out to him, you will turn your call, he'll return your email. He'll help you out because you're helping a veteran. He's so dedicated and incredibly knowledgeable about veteran law, but access to benefits. Um, and he also helped plug us into the New York State Military Museum because as we've discussed, uh, sharing stories of veterans is, is vital to change the narrative. Um, from all those years that 
people are still showing surprise when they're like, wow, there were gay people in Vietnam serving? Wow, I didn't know that. It's, it's incredible. Um, we have these archives from, from Don McIver, who was a Green Beret in Vietnam. He preserved all these wonderful pieces of history from the gay, lesbian, bisexual veterans in the 1980s. They were fighting against Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Huge movement, all these pristine archives. We're going to put, get them interred into the New York State Military Museum. We're in discussions now. They're going to come pick them up in December. It's incredible. And some of the stuff I found in there, when you're going to get a kick out of there, there kick out of this, there's like letters to Jaw Mashariki and from, letters from him to Don McIver showing support and unity, um, showing similar causes for the end of discrimination and, and prejudice. And it's just powerful. And we're going to keep talking about it and we're going to get it out there and add it to the museum so people get a full picture of the full military and, and how inclusive it was without even knowing it. Thank you. Thanks, Ashton. So we have five minutes remaining and um, so we're going to do a lightning round. Um, and I think you've brought up, we've all brought up this point of this issue of visibility actually being crucial to our survival. So uh, there are about 1,255 uh, VA facilities around the country and, and, and uh, the ones that are named, most of the ones that are named are named for white men. Um, and so if you could name um, one individual who should have a VA facility named after them, <laughs> who, who would it be? So this is about, you know, who are, who are your historical heroes? And Wendy, I'll start with you. Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman. I would name it after Harriet Tubman. What a warrior. <laughs> yes. A New Yorker, first woman known to have led troops in combat. She That's is right. the, the mother of special operations. That's um, right. Incredible war hero. That's right. <laughs> Richard, what about you? I guess in light of his most recent passing, Colin Powell, um, I think um, despite some of what people, I guess the the critiques he, he faced, um, I do think he had a really storied military career um, and certainly set a precedent um, for what Black service could, could look like. And so um, I think he should be honored in that way for sure. Thank you. And so um, I, I'll give my, my, before going to Ashton, I'll give mine, um, just because she's a New Yorker, Dr. Mary Walker, um, she, she was born and, and she died in Oswego, New York, and there is a community-based outpatient clinic in, in, in Oswego, um, and she is the only woman to have um, received the, the Medal of Honor uh, thus far. So uh, civil, she was a doctor during the Civil War, really incredible story there. Ashton, who's, who's, who would you name a VA facility after? Harry Watkins. Um, he was an African-American gay man and one of the first service members to challenge the ban against homosexuals in the military. He was kicked out after serving 15 years and they kicked him out when he was going for his last uh, few years uh, to get retirement. Um, and they actually, he appealed his discharge repeatedly and they finally gave him, uh, reinstated him, gave him back pay and an honorable discharge. And he is charismatic and just a wonderful human being. And I would love to see a VA named after him. Thank you, Ashton. So I really want to, I want to take this opportunity to thank our incredible panel, Richard, Ashton, Wendy, thank you so much for sharing your, your stories, your, your insight, your expertise with us today. I, I think you've made it very clear that when we uplift um, uh, minority veterans, um, we uplift this entire community, um, and, and there's so much to be said for uh, sharing our, our powerful stories. So uh, thank you again. Thank you, everyone who's tuned in and is listening. Um, just to, to remind everyone, we'll be taking a short break, and the next panel will begin at 11 o'clock. Thank you, everyone.